This is Brad Bailey. I'm here in um, New York City, New York, uh, at the LGBT Center on 13th Street. The date is October 29th, 2018. And I'm here uh, conducting an interview for the Stonewall Oral History Project with Randy Wicker. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Um, so, sir, can you give me your, uh, your name, your pronouns, and we'll go from there. My name is Randolph, or Randy Wicker. My pronoun is he. And um, can you tell me where you were born and what your name was when you were born? And we'll, we'll go through. I was born as Charles Gervin Hayden Jr. in Baltimore, Maryland in 1938. And what was your childhood like? My childhood was very, uh, very unique because I, my mother was taken away with tuberculosis when I was five. So I was essentially raised by a stone death grandmother who had no friends. And as a child, I had no interactions with other people what to speak of until I went to school where they said I didn't socialize well and suggested they get me a dog. So I really was raised by someone that was someone picked on me. My grandmother would say they picked on you because they know you're superior. So I feel that a lot of that had to do with that I was free of peer pressure, which I think pushes in on an awful lot of people. They get all of their self-image from, from relationships with other people. And in my case, I got it mainly just from a very strong grandmother. And uh, my mother took me back at the age of 12. But up to that point, I had not lived with my mother and my father. Wait, so you said your mother was away? My, she was taken away for tuberculosis, which they told my father, forget you have a, a this woman's very sick, forget you have a wife. And every woman in that hospital lost their husband except my mother. And my father stood by her, and she finally, through some special treatment, came out. Then she relapsed a little bit, went back in, but still, it took seven years out of her life, because I didn't get to live with them until I was 12 years old. And you, you said you were born in New Jersey? In right? Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, okay, so that's Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore. please. <laughs> so, where, so where did Plainfield, New Jersey come into effect then? Well, I was raised in Central Florida, a very redneck center of the town, a phosphate town, factory town. And when I was 17 years old, my father got a promotion to the New York office. At that point, for the last three months of my high school, my senior year in high school, I went to Plainfield, New Jersey. And there, there I, my father would commute to New York City, and I would have ac access to his weekend pass, because he had a week, a week unlimited ride pass that I could use Friday, Saturday, Sunday to come into the city. So then the majority of your child, where did your grandmother raise you? What, what, Baltimore, you Mer well? Baltimore Sorry, Maryland. Got it. And then when I was taken to Florida. At 12. Yeah, and my grandmother died about two or three years later. Okay. And my grandfather shortly after that. So then uh, I guess I, essentially your childhood was between Baltimore, Florida, and Plainfield. Right. I, I was essentially raised in real Crackerville, Florida. Because from the ages of, when I went to Florida, it was a factory town. There was a railroad track, so the white people lived over here, the black people lived over there without any indoor plumbing, and the Puerto Ricans had six or seven houses right at the front of the black section of the town. I was a newspaper boy who worked three routes, delivered up to four or five, six hundred papers a day, morning and afternoon, and spent all my time collecting in both sides of town. Wow. And, um, and, and the town again was? Pierce, Florida. Pierce, Florida. It doesn't exist anymore. It was a factory town, and when they told them they had to put indoor plumbing in for the African-American sections, they decided to just tear down the town and sell the houses to the people that wanted them. But by that time, my father had been located to the New York offices, where, which were headquarters. And so in terms of uh, sexuality, what was your childhood like with regard to that? Uh, very little. I once asked my mother what the uh, F-U-C-K word meant. She threatened to throw an iron at me, told me I should ask that questions like that to my father. What age was that? Oh, I must have been maybe 12, 13. And then she said I shouldn't associate with people that use words like that. And my father, the only thing my father ever told me about sex was that the world revolved around sex and money. That was all he really ever said. But I knew I was gay. Well, first of all, I should begin with religion. I went to Catholic school till I was fifth grade. And I stood by a big tree at the age of seven. 
And they taught us in Catholic school, at the age of seven, you're the age of reason. You can burn in hellfire forever for committing a mortal sin. And I said, by a big tree, I still remember and say, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't believe in all that stuff. That's nonsense. I'm not going to, you know, I just did not. I think that, I believe that religious belief is very much like sexual orientation. We like to think we make choices, but we don't. We either believe or we don't believe. And I was fortunate enough not to, not to, not to be a devoutly religious person. So I didn't have any problems dealing with, is, is this right in God's view, or is this right in the church's view, or anything like that? Although I am a confirmed Catholic. You are a confirmed yes, Catholic. I am. And so, uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Not, no. I was the only child. My mother didn't want to have me. Uh, she had a very difficult delivery, so only 23 hours. And when I was born, my head was as big as my body because it was such a difficult childbirth that I had a huge water bubble on my head. And so for a day, they wouldn't show me to my mother. My mother said, you tell me that I had a child, it's a healthy boy, won't you show him to me? So a nurse put a napkin or tissue on my head and presented me to my mother, at which point the tissue fell off my head. My mother shrieked in horror because she thought she had given birth to a Mongolian idiot or some sort of, you know, freak. And it took, they said it would take a month, but it took a year for that water bubble to go away. And she described that how they would circle the bed and my father would say, look at that boy, his eyes are following us. There's nothing wrong with that boy. She said, your father always had faith in you. And she did not want to have a child. She hated children. She moved to Sun City to get away from children. But she was a very conservative woman. And it was her duty to bear her husband a child. And the doctors told her this girl really was not made for childbirth. And also, one of the things I always was interested in as I went into jail, into a career of journalism, even editing girly magazines and such before I, in my in the early 60s, this obsession with large breasts. And I finally asked my mother at the age of 52, I knew that she, I knew that my mother was too puritanical to ever nurse me, because you always hear about the mother having the child, and taking the child and suckling it, this bond developing. And she said, no, it was impossible. I said, what do you mean impossible? She said, I had inverted nipples. And at that point, I understood why. I was always attracted to flat-chested males and women, both. I, you know, I understood at that point why I didn't have the fixation on breasts, which in years since then, whenever I talk to married women, Tell them that really their husband's obsession with breasts is wanting to go back to a nurse, nurse at their mother's breast. They all laugh hysterically and agree. The men become terribly upset and deny it all. <laughs> so you mentioned, though, that your mother's conservative and that your father seemed to have a bit of a different approach to, to this, these issues. Part of that was because my father told, when he, he read my diary after I came out and I'd just gone off to Arizona to. I was madly in love with a boy. I was going to rob a bank, send him the money, and commit suicide. <laughs> but this was after my first year in college. I hadn't quite yet discovered gay life. <laughs> and uh, he read my diary, and he told me he had read it. I wish I had that diary. I tore it up and, and burned it. And he told me that I know why you're gay because when you were five years old, you came in the bathroom crying, Daddy, why has Mommy run off and left me? Why has Mommy deserted me? So that gave my father a, a rationale for believing that that's what caused me to be gay. And he had gone and found some apparently good psychiatric advice. He said, I talked to a, a doctor, a psychiatrist. They said, you will always be this way. And I want you to be the best adjusted homosexual you can be because I will not always be here to protect you. And he enabled me to be the first college-educated person in my family. And everything I am today, I am because I stand on my father's shoulders. And yet he told me when I joined Mattachine, I showed him the literature. He, he looked at it, he said, well, I just wish I could go back to that time and show him what's happened since. He said, well, I don't think you're going to get very far with this. Just do me one favor, will you? I said, what's that? He said, don't involve my good name. Because he was an official of the American Agricultural Chemical Company, Charles Gervin Hayden Sr., and I'm Charles Gervin Hayden Jr. So therefore, I picked the activist name of Randolph 
Randolph Randy Wicker. And when I changed my name legally after making some money in 1967, I changed it to Randolph Hayden Wicker. I never felt that Randolph Wicker was ever a pseudonym because I used that name when I went on TV as a first homosexual face in the audience on mask on TV and radio. So I always felt that I was Randolph Wicker. And when I finally reached the point where I was my own man, my own boss, I could become Randolph Hayden Wicker. And that to me was a very important moment in my life. But my father, I came home from my 25th, on my 25th birthday from his funeral. He dropped dead at the age of 49. He had just heard that I was making radio programs on BAI. BAI? Yeah, WBAI. And he was a Republican, a Taft Republican, but right, he told me. Clarify that just for the record. Right. WBAI. WBAI FM. I, I had, but that, that had been my big break. I had come to New York City and I had heard a discussion on WBAI, but these doctors are out huxing their wares. We can cure any homosexual eight or 10 sessions. I guess fifty, hundred dollars a session, whatever the price was in those days. And I went to BAI and I said to Dick Elman and the people there, I said, this is outrageous. These people are just hucksters. You know what, homosexuals, we're the, we're really the uh, authorities on homosexuality. We live it, we know what it's about. Those people know nothing. Except they see sick people that hate themselves and want to change. And so they said to me, get together a panel and I'll do the interview. And I did that, got attacked in the General American a week before it was to be broadcast, calling me a, calling it a six man or something panel and change those letters. It called me a card carrying swish, which I was anything but in those days. I always presented a very conservative appearance because I think if you're going to speak about serious issues, nothing's more important than wearing a black suit and tie. That was in 1962, correct? That was, yeah, that was 1962. Oh, okay. I had joined Mattachine in 1958, right, four so years earlier. 20, that was 25, you were 20 when you joined Mattachine. Right. But I want to back up for a second, um, quickly. Um, you mentioned that your father sort of had this awareness of you being gay at around five years old. No, when, no, no, when he found out I was gay by reading my diary when I was 17 or 18, he, he, he told me that he thought I was gay because I felt my mother had deserted me. Oh, God, so he had that awareness when you were 17, 18. Okay. Yeah, in other words, that was his way, that was his way of explaining it to himself, but it's probably very difficult for many people to explain to themselves. It gave him a convenient, but it was not really a legitimate reason of why I'm gay. So that was then the, 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 the first time when he read, why did he read your diary, curious, why did you? Well, I had run off to Arizona, and I guess he was curious, and I had left my diary in a lockbox, and he broke open the lockbox. By the time he found me in Arizona, I had come out, I had a new, a new lover who was also a bank teller at another bank, and I, the boy I was crazy, madly in love with before I came out, when I met him a year later, I looked at him and I thought, what was it I found so interesting about this person? You know, it was just strange series of experiences, and thank goodness my father uh, was understanding and supportive because he told me, I didn't tell your mother, she couldn't understand, she would never accept, which happened actually to be true. My mother never did really accept. At the age of 80, she told me that the woman that drove her around to her medical appointment says she was getting early Alzheimer's, had a daughter that was that way. What can you do? When did she pass away? She, she passed away at 90 in a assisted living facility with Alzheimer's for years. She was spoon fed and diaper, didn't know who she, didn't even know her, knew her name on a good day. All right, so we're gonna move um, sort of toward those later teen years, right before you get to New York. Um, but I wanna sort of understand, so you, why did you, you, were you in high school when you went to Arizona? No, no, I, I, had I, I, I had, I graduated from, I went to school in Mulberry and Lakeland, Florida. Then I went to Plainfield High School for three months. I graduated technically from Plainfield High School. Then I went for one year to Washington and Lee University, actually two years. And then I finally had met someone. I'd come out in New York. I discovered gay life. And I met a boy from University of Texas. And he said, oh, come to Texas, right? And it was very inexpensive because Texas had found oil under the desert. The, the Texas legislator had to have a land great college, so they looked for, oh, that desert out there, that's a perfect land for a land great college. Then Texas found oil under it, and at the time, I think Texas was one of the best endowed universities in the nation, second only to Harvard or Yale or something, because they had found oil under all this land they had. And out-of-state tuition was $250 a semester, 
in state tuition was fifty dollars a semester. All right. So after Arizona, you stay, how about long did you stay out there for? Or, or six the months, say, I, I, six or nine months. All right, then back to New York, and then that you, when you say sorry, when you say when your father sort of you had this sort of coming of age sort of right, work. right. That was in 1958. That was between in, during the semester of 1958. I went. I'd heard about Manichean Society. I had read some of their publications. I was very interested. I found this, and when we talked in a bar about Manichean Society, they talked like it was some big organization with all these powerful lawyers and all that. And I found an organization, I think I was the 16th member, on the sixth floor of a walk-up built, ratty little building at 6th Avenue and 48th Street. And they had, they had meetings once a month there where people would get up and talk. Uh, Maybe a lawyer would talk like what to do in case you're arrested by the police or some psychiatrist would talk, are we sick or aren't we sick? Or you'd have a theologian talk about are we sinners or aren't we sinners? And I think there was a, there was a very horrible mentality going on all through the gay community in those days. Uh, and they, I'd go, see for me, I, entered, I went to Lenny's Hideaway off Sheridan Square. And here is suddenly this bar filled with all these young men going to Brown, just graduated from law school Sorry, at Columbia. What year, was this again? Huh? what year was this again? That would have been 19, maybe 56 or 7. Continue. And so I, to me, it was a, to me, gay life was such a blessing. I didn't have any guilt about it. I knew what I was. I was scared of other people finding out. I just wanted to find, and I read a book when I was at Washington Lee, it was called Rodney Garland's Heart in Exile, and he talked about seeing a sailor go into a bar, and it was a gay bar, and suddenly all these books I'd read, they were all, all about piano teachers seducing their piano students in 1875 or something, right? And suddenly I realized there are gay bars, there's, there's a place where I can go and meet other homosexuals. And so I went and sat in Washington Square Park with red stockings up to here, trying to be obvious, and a guy about 30 came by, picked me up, took me home to MacDougall Street, and finally showed me where Lenny's Hideaway was, which was the middle class, all college people. They, My Fair and Lenny was a big hit at the time. It's saying, stay, all standing on the corner watching all the boys go by, My Fair and Lady. And uh, I entered a world where I had never been to a theater, never been to any exposure to all of the arts. We had one friend of the family who went to the opera. It was considered sort of strange. And I met the music, the theater reviewer for the Dallas Morning News. And one week I saw West Side Story, Auntie Mame, uh, My Fair Lady, and one or two other shows. So I, I, I found that for me, and suddenly I was in, because I'm young and good looking, and I'm invited to these parties where these people live in these luxurious penthouses, and, I learned about it's important to have a Rogers Pete or a Brooks Brothers label. And I was at the level where I, I love Formica furniture, because when you had a drink, you put it down, it didn't leave a ring on Formica furniture. And I remember a guy telling me once, he said, see that, that's an antique bureau over there. If you buy that and have it 10 years, when you sell it, it will have increased in value. And I just remember him telling me that, because it turned out many, many years later, that was the second business I went into. And so for the next, uh, I guess from around that time in 57, 58 until the beginning of, uh, until 1968, can you sort of run me through, uh, you know, in a sort of a quick way, uh, what your activities were? You said you started with Mattachine and then obviously discovering some of the New York City gay life around right, Sheridan right. Square. And then can you sort of just tell me what, what your life, what the trajectory of your life was like from that point for the next few years? Yeah, well, I was always very interested in the gay movement. I think I wrote my first article, A Feminacy Versus Affectation, for the Manichean Review. I think it was 1960, might have been 1962, and maybe it was early, maybe 1959. I have to look that up. But anyway, I went out in bars, and they made fun of me, because I would talk about, why don't we join Manichean? You know, we need to have a movement. We need to change attitudes. Because, see, I have always been somebody who was a truth seeker and an injustice fighter. And when I looked at the world on TV or in the media, everyone who was a homosexual, they either a child molester because of Leopold and Loeb, thrilled child killers, or Bergeson and Lane were communists that had defected to the Soviet Union out of England, 
or, or they were mentally ill, or they were drag queens, you would see they had drag shows on A Street that take the tourists to see all the queers dressed up as women. And so the whole image of homosexuals where they were all either drag queens or communists or crazy child molesters and homosexuality was illegal in every state except Illinois. And I knew that these, you know, I was going out meeting beautiful young men and having wonderful, wonderful interactions and romantic affairs and there was nothing wrong with this. So I had this disconnect in my life. I had this beautiful life with this beautiful society and no one seemed to know about the real gay society. And then you had this tabloid distorted image in the media. So I always tell people that I really was basically a journalist from the beginning. And I thought, well, we have to educate people. If people really know what gay people are like, we don't have to worry. They will understand that all these crazy ideas they have about gay people will disappear. But homosexuals didn't feel that way. In the bars, they would say things like, well, I don't want to be associated with that dyke over there. Or it's best if they don't know that we're normal looking because as long as they think we all have falsetto voices and we all wear dresses, then we normal looking people, we're safe. And it was, and I even had people say, but don't you think this subterranean atmosphere, this underground world where we live is just so charming and exotic? And there was just a total lack of identity of, of self. As a matter of fact, one of the early articles in the Village Voice interviewed David Mac Reynolds at the time. He, and he said if gays organized around anybody, they'd probably vote for Joseph McCarthy. And that was, he called it a third party for the third sex, because I was the first one to propose that early, early in the 1960s. And so um, around that time, you mentioned, around that time then, around the uh, sort of late 19, well, not late 1960s, but um, actually, that's a shock, right? No, but let me, let me go back, let me go back to the, port, the three, two important stories. Sure. Mattachina had a weekly, they cleaned out this loft on the sixth floor, it was $50 a month rent, and they put a hand, maybe it would seat 40 people tops. They would have their monthly lectures and they were from 15 to 25 people would show up. I said, why don't you publicize these things? And they said, eh, go, why not, go ahead. So I had for five cents a piece, 300 signs made that said, citizens, a lawyer discusses homosexuality in the law, questions answered, free admission, Mattachine Society, and I gave the address. And I went all around New York City and I found people read their own prejudices into the sign, like some ladies at antique shops on Third Avenue would say, oh yes, we should do something to help the boys, and would put one in their window. But a guy that owned a deli down in South Village said, I worked for the Vice Squad for 20 years, it was about time we did something about these perverts, put two in my window. So the day of the lecture came, where instead of the 15 to 25 people they normally had, they had 300 people show up. It went, it went all the way down through all five fights and then down the street. And the amazing thing was most of those people who showed up were women wearing bobby socks. And Tony Segura, who was active in the Mattachine at the time, ran over to Freedom House, which is at 41st Street, and had them take in the overflow. And so, but as a result of this, the guy that owned the building came up to the Mattachine people and said, you know, I have no objection, you people, you've cleaned out this mess of a place that you've run it, and, but I have a bar on the ground floor, and I can't have an organization like yours in the building where I have a liquor license. So Manachine ended up getting evicted because I had done the most successful promotion it ever had. This caused a huge split. The split was between those who said, but wait a minute, that's what we're supposed to be about, changing public attitudes. And here we had 300 people who never had a successful thing like that. The other people, probably many of whom had worked long hours cleaning out the hall, said, that troublemaker from Texas, he's no end of trouble, he got us evicted. And so there was a real fear, especially with Mattachine, even with the leadership, which was very conservative, because we were a, a nonprofit educational research organization focusing on the issue of homosexuality. And they felt that they couldn't even dare lobby because anything they did that reeked of political activity or activism, so to speak, uh, could be misinterpreted and cause them to lose their status as a 501c3, whatever it was, organization. So that caused a real division, which in the beginning was, I asked John D'Amelio once, I said, where do I fit in the gay movement? 
He said, I would consider you to be the first gay militant. And things uh, that actually sort of considered in Mattachine, and then finally towards about mid-63 or 64, after I dropped out of law school, come back and become a freelance writer, uh, uh, the liberals won the, uh, we won, we won over, we, t we took over the society. But meanwhile, they were so afraid of doing anything. So the people in Mattachine, like Craig Rodwell, Rene Capiero, uh, and I showed the guy who, who actually ended up being elected president the final year, we would all get together. I would put out packets of homosexual literature for a dollar a packet, advertised in the Village Voice. And uh, we would do things like I got Sex Freedom League to co sponsor a demo down at the induction, Army Induction Center down at Whitehall here in New York City. It was actually the first time there had been public demonstrations for homosexual civil rights. I don't like the term gay rights. There's no such thing as a gay right. Every so-called gay right is really just a civil right, the right to be safe in your home, not to be secure in your job, not to be physically attacked, the right to live your life in private as you choose to see fit if you don't, with other adults without harming anyone. And I think this term gay right really, it was very easy and very fast and a lot easier to say than civil rights for homosexuals, but what did it lead to? Gay rights are special rights. That was Anita Bryant's, that's been the right wing's big catchphrase for years and years and years. Because no one made it quite clear from the beginning that all gay rights are just civil rights for homosexuals being treated equally, which they did in the marriage equality debate and that's how they won it. So you were obviously, your central role in, in Mattachine at that time was, was very integral um, in a way and obviously, and, and so what do you think life was like sort of right at that period right before Stonewall. What do you think it was sort of, um, you know, what do you think it was like in some regard for, for people who, who lived in the village, who were gay, who were either part of Mattachine or who weren't part of Mattachine? Well, let me tell you what it was like before that. When I went to the University of Texas, if you were known to be homosexual or someone said you were homosexual, you were called into the dean's office, you were given three days to drop out of school with nothing on your record, or you could take a lie detector test administered by the Texas Rangers to prove your innocence, that you were not homosexual. And there had been a raid back in the early 50s, supposedly, where a lot of people had been rounded up and kicked out of school. I actually got involved in politics, began running, uh, first to abolish student government, then I started get running for, as a candidate my senior year. I was in a three-way race for presidency of the student body and I had quite a very avid following. So the dean of men found out through a counselor that someone had told him, I was, the counselor I was gay, that I was gay. So they called me in and said, we just want you to know that we've been told you're homosexual, we cannot have a homosexual as a public representative of the student body. And uh, I sort of bluffed it and denied it. But as things got closer and closer to election day, I remember this one big showdown with this student, he came up to me outside the student union there at the University of Texas. He said, I know you're a queer because I'm dating a girl in the drama department and she knows somebody you went to bed with. And I said, you know, I said, I majored in psychology. In psychology, we study that people that are obsessed with this topic usually have some sort of problems in that area. So I just want to tell you something, buddy. You throw one handful of mud at me, I'm going to throw 10 handful of Folds of mud back at you. And I said, you know, I'm gonna graduate, go back to New Jersey, maybe go to law school, have my career there. Where are you from again? Oh, Whittier, Texas. You're gonna go back to Whittier, Texas, and you know what? 40 years from now, there are gonna be stories around there, of people saying, you know, they said some strange things about him when he was back at the University of Texas. So if you wanna, you wanna tackle me, just go ahead. No mud was thrown, but I had enough of a scare because I had friends that were kicked out who just, who, one guy had an affair with a guy in the army, went out and told the people at the Air Force, told the people at the Air Force base that the guy was gay because it was his lover that had a fight. And not only did he get kicked out of the Air Force, but then he, the guy who turned him in, got kicked out of the university just for being gay. But with me, because I'd become so well known, I had this big rabble rouser image because I, when they were going to raise a rent, the, tuition in Texas from $50 a semester to $100 a semester, 
I organized a march on the state capitol, which turned out into a small riot. A bunch of frat rats threw me in that fountain, and I came tumbling out of the fountain fighting. And that really struck a chord with people. I was all across the state with my arm raised, dripping wet, opposing a tuition raise at the University of Texas, which I think was prescient because it, today, that would be equivalent of $500 to $1,000. You have to go to Texas today. Free education there doesn't exist either. You end up with twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 of debt. And on top of that, I also was running as an integrationist because I said that I always stood up to injustice. I went to the University of Texas. We were sitting in to integrate McCroy's. And two things happened. At the Young Democrats, Lyndon Johnson was running for president. And every day in the local paper and TV stations, some new delegates declared their support for Lyndon Johnson, who had no hope. He was a Texas senator. So I got up in the group where we all knew that Lyndon Johnson was not our friend in those days. And said, we have a great, great senator here in Austin. And of course, you know, there's this gas, collective gas, because they don't know how I, I, I would handle it. And I said, I think that we should call on him to prove his sincerity on the issue of civil rights by giving us editorial support in the newspapers and TV stations that he owns here in Austin, Texas. And he got us around standing, standing ovation and made the APY the next day. The students at the University of Texas calling Lyndon Johnson to prove his sincerity by supporting their, their sit-in. So I had, and I was going to appoint, there were only 200 African Americans in the school. And one of them was named Jenny Franklin, who was very vivacious, incredibly wonderful. And I said, as president of the student body, I was going to appoint her a cheerleader. You got to appoint one cheerleader. And by doing that, I would have integrated the entire Southwestern Conference of the United States. And I just, you know, so I ran as a progressive. And I had friends that told me, you know, my friend, he says he can't vote for you because you know, you're a, an end lover. You know, but I, I simply stood up for what I thought was right. And I came within 30 votes of winning. I mean, I led right to the last, box, last two boxes and one vibe. I, it was a three-way race, and I was beaten out by 30 votes. If I'd gotten in the runoff, we knew the fraternity man was stuck at 2,000 votes. I lost like by 30 votes. I got all the way. And I became, they did a fantastic write-up about me. As a matter of fact, I went back to Austin, and the local Austin American did this wonderful story just this past fall that Randy Wicker roared as a student activist in the 19, 1960s, 1960 at University of Texas. And I got to speak to the trans group there and tell them that the future was theirs, that I had seen the world change so much that when I started the movement, there were more people in that room there than there were in the entire nation of the United States. So when I joined Mattachine in 1958, and we thought we could change the world, and we did. And I was sure that they were going to continue the fight, and they were going to leave a better world for the next generation, just as we had worked to leave a better world for them. Um, and so obviously that time in Texas sort of prepared you for your, that time in New York. And it also taught me that I, I, I'm so happy that it was probably the worst thing that ever happened because I really wanted to win that election. I dreamt about it for years. But I realized, looking back, I could have come to New York City. I could have gotten involved in politics. And I had a certain charisma. And I was a very truthful person. But it was too early. This country was not ready at that time. I went to law school for a semester and decided I hated the law because it wasn't about justice, it was about the law. And it didn't enter my mind that you could be a lawyer and be gay until a guy in Florida about two or three years later, 62, three or four, finally won a suit which they said as a gay person he had the right to be a member of the bar. But I dropped out of law school because I didn't want to spend my, my life among members of the bar and have to go to law school for three years, do an internship for three years. And the idea of putting off having a life in New York City as a gay man for eight or 10 years was unthinkable when you're you know, 20, 21 years old. Well, and, and that's, that, that's why it's perfect. Because I want to go and I want to sort of understand what was life like in 1968, 69? Like all of this prepared you for sort of you know, was sort of a build-up in a way, in a sense. Yeah. And I, I was curious as to what life was like specifically in New York, um, like around the, 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 you know, the early part of, of 19, or around 1968, 69. And can you sort of tell me what life was like, like exactly right before Stonewall for people? Well, it, it wasn't York. just before Stonewall. All during the 60s, 
you know, we first broke into radio in 62, and I was the first one to go on unmasked of the homosexual nuts crane show in 65. And we had publicly demonstrated in 64. But it had gone from being a question of they're all sick and how can we cure them? There had been enough, enough education, enough discussion on the airways. The question had been more, are they sick or aren't they sick? Are they sinners, aren't they sinners? I mean, there was this, we had enlarged the dialogue. And I think that the consciousness of people very slowly improved. But still, there was a, a, a terrible, because if you, if you were, got homosexuality on your record, you couldn't even be a cabaret singer. I mean, imagine you're someone who sings in a musical band or you're a theater performer. A lot of cabaret work goes on in bars or places where they serve alcohol. You couldn't get a cabaret license if you got homosexuality on your, on your record. And there were things where they'd send officers driving convertibles up and down Central Park West to pick up somebody. They asked them what they liked to do or something meant they made a compromising comment out came the, the handicuffs and they were arrested or they weren't trapped or they were caught in the bushes. Uh, you know, there used to be a lot of sexual activity in the rambles up there. And uh, so having homosexuality on your record, and I got a 4F exemption for being gay. And I considered it a great blessing because I didn't have to go in the war. I was very much against the Vietnam War and everything. And I got so tired. We had bigger and bigger meetings at, at a Freedom House. And I know Donald Webster Cornell would give, take turns giving fun to peel pitches, see who got the most per, per attendee. And I just, I had a friend. He was a friend that had actually marched with me on that march on the Capitol. And he lived with this woman for two years and she got pregnant. And I was a contact man with the abortionist. And the thing was he was gonna call me at one o'clock or noon. So I was home, the call came, and, it was $500 for the abortion. All they had was two, $432. And I said, all they have is $432. He said three words, tough luck, buddy, click. Now at that point, we didn't have any phone number for him. I don't know how this went on, but through someone they knew, they, I guess maybe they had given up their phone to get the money together they could get together. So two or three weeks later, I discovered that he had met the parents of the woman he'd been living with for two years over a bed in Bellevue Hospital where she had nearly died miscarrying a baby that he had, a pregnancy that he had caused. And at that point, a huge light bulb went off in my mind. And I said, society is not screwed up just about homosexuality. Society is screwed up about sex in general. And I was so tired of the the guilt and are we sick, aren't we sick, are we sinners, aren't we sinners, the, the terrible self-hating, self-hatred. It was so rampant in the gay community. I left the gay movement. I said, well, I want to go out with a sex freedom like you pick it for right of abortion, right, for conjugal visits for prisoners, right? And then I met the people and became editor of the marijuana newsletter with Allen Ginsberg and William Bro. That? that was 1965 or 66. Oh. So, and I also joined the first march against the war in Vietnam, which Time Magazine said a bunch of kooks walked up protesting the war in Vietnam. And only 5% of the, of the country at the time opposed the war in Vietnam. And so I evolved into, I ended up writing for a living, selling some of the transcripts of the stuff I'd done on interviews. And I ended up getting a job as a girly magazine editor, which was fun because we just put the pictures, between the pictures were articles about Lee Mar, Lee Lights, marijuana, debates about homosexuality. In other words, you know, it was really essentially a very liberated. I mean, I've had to get one fan letter, which I, I've always liked. It's so funny. He said, I've read your magazine, and as an editor, you have big brass balls. <laughs> so, uh, did you go into. Um... Well, people don't understand about Stonewall. It was a dive. By that, I mean it had no liquor license. It was on the second floor. It wasn't on the ground floor the way you see it today. Knocked on the door, and they let you in. <coughs> and <clears throat> the reason that I think Stonewall really ended up being one of the kicking points, there were usually at least three dancing bars in New York, usually one or two in the Upper West 70s, and then there was the Stonewall. As I tell people, m most middle class, respectable east side kind of queen suit and tie crowd 
wouldn't be caught dead at the Stonewall because among other things at Stonewall you had a bunch of finger snapping Spanish queens. Well, finger snapping Spanish queens were exactly my cup of tea in those days. So I just loved the dancing bars. And actually that Stonewall was the very last dancing bar when it was raided. That's something people, I don't think people realize either. It would be the, there was no other place in New York City where you could go and dance until the cops came in and they turned on the white light. So you frequented it a lot then. How often did you go? Well, I had actually by that time settled down. I had met my first lover uh, in 1964 at the age of 26. And we uh, were running a button. I, I used to, as a hobby, put out a button a week. And then I started Let's uh, Legalize Pot. Equality for Homosexuals was my first successful button. I took it to a party. And I had it on my lapel. And people came in, where'd you get that button? I said, oh, I, I published them. And I'll never forget that evening, because I've never been to a party before or since, where everyone at the party came over, introduced themselves to me. And I left that party that night with $38 in my pocket. Now, that was around 65 or 66. And $38 in those days was like $380. I mean, it was a lot of money. And not only that, everyone had come over and introduced themselves to me. Actually, I picked up this construction worker who really wasn't exactly my cup of tea, but I knew everybody in the party was dying to, to have to pick the party, so to speak. So I gave myself that luxury of the night. So I, how many times, like, I'm curious though, how many times a week did you actually go to Stonewall, like actually walk inside the bar, if you can remember? I wouldn't say it was a weekly thing because at that point I was married, I was settled down. I, I, I didn't go to, uh, uh, I went to bars, but I would go, at the age of 26, how old would I have been then? I, dis I discovered that all my friends I met through politics, through writing, through activities, and that bars were really just places where if you weren't the cutest thing in the bar and everyone buying you drinks were very boring places. So I would go to bars occasionally, but I, I would say I didn't go to a bar maybe two or three times a month, if that, because also once I settled down with a lover, what we would do, because we didn't have an open relationship, in the baths in those days, we had an agreement. We'd go to the bath on 10 o'clock tonight together, get separate rooms, run around and do whatever we wanted to with anyone. This was way before there was HIV or anything. And then we'd meet at 4 o'clock and go home together. And the ground rules were no giving of phone numbers, no making of dates, right? And you know how many times I went there? Two things I found out. One is after sometimes I'd meet someone, I'd say, you're very nice. You know, I'd really like to see more of you. but Unfortunately, you know, I'm here and I have an arrangement with my lover. Do you know how many other people said to me, you too? I was amazed. It was, I think it was a very common pattern. And then on top of that, I used to tell people that promiscuity, I was always looking for love, even though I was very promiscuous as a young person. I was always looking for love. And the, the, the quality of a relationship is what's important in life. And even, even in these sort of frantic little flurries of going out and having something outside of your marital bed, sex with a stranger is awkward. They don't know that you like this or you don't like that. They don't know how to play your body like a musical instrument the way your lover does. So even though you had this experience, in no way did it compete with the sex that you had at home with your lover afterwards. So, which is I'm saying that really, sex with a stranger never competes with a good, good marital partner. So, but I'm, I'm curious though, um, around, because I want to I sort of tally back here to Stonewall and sort of try to understand uh, what was the first inkling you had of riots or some kind of disturbance? I read in the newspaper Queen Bee singing mad. Her mascara was running and she was singing mad. You know, they had raided the Stonewall bar. I mean, Wait, I'm curious, was that the second day or the first day? That was, a, that was a, the headline in the paper the next day. That was the Daily News. I think that was the Sunday after. Or Saturday, and I, that was the next day's paper, I'm almost certain. Were you, were you there? No, you I wasn't there. Okay, you weren't there, okay. And as a matter of, I mean, so I walked over with Jack Nichols and Lodge Clark. They, they were our best friends, mm -hmm. my lover and I, and we were looking for all this activity. Now, what it was is that people- Sorry to interrupt. What day was that? Was that the first? You said you, you weren't there the first night, but what day did you walk over? Well, was the rain on Friday or Saturday night? Which night? Did you know which one? Um, it was a, it was a Friday night. Yeah, so late Friday night, early, yeah, so one o'clock in the morning. Okay, well, we, we, went o we went over the next night. We went over looking for the trouble. 
and we simply didn't find any. It would seem like well, the way it worked is the police were on guard, so the minute they would see a group of people, eight, ten people gather, and they would run and disperse them. So contrary to this image that you get, this supposedly there was a battle that went on in the streets for weeks, it was very sporadic. Yes, the police were there, and yes, the queens were coming and getting together, but then they were being quickly dispersed. So there wasn't like this raging, like you would think, raging violence in the streets. But they did have a community meeting at the, um, over on St. Mark's Place, right opposite my shop, the, electri the Electric Circus. What was the name? I think it was, might have been 10 days at, I always thought it was a, only a few days later, but it was the first community meeting. And Mattachine Society had put up a sign in the window of the Stonewall. Mattachine Society asked homosexual citizens to obey the law and not to create public disorder. And I was asked to speak because up to that time, I was considered to be the spokesperson. Matter of fact, some of the articles said that, you know, the feminists had Betty Friedan, now the homosexuals have Randolph Wicker. I mean, I was considered the person. I was the most known spokesperson. Now, at that time, people forget 1969, 68, Martin Luther King was killed. And because we had Lindsay as mayor of New York walking the liberal Republican walking the streets of Harlem. There were no riots in New York City, but there was a lot of calls for a civilian police review board. So we had a liberal mayor, and the police were in the center of attention because there had been so many disturbances and so much, so much disagreement about what had happened in other cities. But the one thing that everyone agreed upon in the press was that the black community had shot itself in the foot because where there used to be a bodega or two where a few jobs for kids during the summer, now there was nothing. It had been burned down, that they had destroyed, they had shot themselves in the foot by burning down their own neighborhood. So when I got up to speak, I borrowed a line from Jesse Jackson, which I thought was very appropriate, and that was that rocks through windows don't open doors. And I said the homosexual community should become involved politically and socially, we should not have, we should not resort to violence and disruptive behavior. And as I was speaking, saying just that, somebody in the back, there was a commotion. One boy who had come to that meeting, some bouncer said, are you one of those queers? He said, yes, I am. And ended up getting the Dickens beaten out of him. A big riot broke out. I drove the boy home that night. I'll never forget it. I drove him home. And he said, I've been in the movement three days, and I've been beaten up three times. And all I could think is, I've been in the movement 11 years, I haven't been beaten up once. And you know, when I found out, people tell me, they say to me, where did you ever get the nerve to do what you did? It all started, of all things, at high noon on MacDougall Street, where there's a member of the Sex Freedom League, he was an anarchist with a black and red flag, had a speak out where he put up this little stand you could stand on. And I stood up at MacDougall, I think it's probably MacDougall on 3rd Street or something, and I said, right down that, street there's a bar, and that bar is a gay bar, and the only way it operates is by paying off the police. And I think homosexuals have a right to congregate, should have a right to their bar, and it's not in the public interest for bars like that to function only by paying off the police. That is corruption of, the so of society, so social society. Wait, what year did you say this? This was probably 1964. Okay, so but what it was is, I can tell you, when I stood up on that, and it was a, even though it was the village, it was a 90% plus heterosexual crowd. They were all tourists, and there were not any gay people at noon or one o'clock when I did this, and my feet were shaking. But what I got, and I didn't get any cat calls, I got a light smattering of applause. So I tell people when I found out that if you go out and you present your arguments in a civil way, make your points. I used to have argued that homosexuals were a minority group. What do you mean that minority group? The fact is sociology, if one group, that member of minority group does something bad, the whole group is tarnished. And that's exactly what happened with us, with Ferguson, Mullane, Leopold, and Loeb, you know. Uh, we, we, were, we were, so you even had to argue that with people. But I found that people were willing to listen to you and, and in engage in dialogue and give you a hearing, and then they would ask their questions. Now, the questions I was constantly asked, which tended to make me somewhat of a, uh, uh, well, 
misogynist in the right, whatever, anti, anti trans, you might say, is that Kath Jorgensen had just had the sex change operation, which is what it was called in those days. He said, well, why do you have to have a sex change operation to become a woman to have sex with a man? She said, oh, I could never have sex with a man as a man, because that's against my religion. That's an awful sin. So I came to the false conclusion, because I had no idea what gender identity was, to the false conclusion that people who had sex change operations were guilt-ridden homosexuals who were out mutilating themselves to just fit into the, into the structure of society. I like men, therefore I have to be a woman. And so that actually was a very mistaken idea on my part. And ultimately, I finally, through associations, very slowly I started meeting a more diverse group of people. Some lesbians introduced me to a bunch of actually heterosexual cross-dressers. Susanna had a, a ranch upstate, and that was the first time I met, I met true transsexuals. And when he came into a restaurant where we were having dinner, they look like my mother's bridge partners. They were middle-aged and they go totally non compared to the drag queens who are very flashy and stand out in the crowd. So when you said, uh, I want to back, uh, go back to the, the, the time when you said you made the speech, uh, right, I guess, shortly after Stonewall, uh, to the crowd. And no, you, that was before Stonewall. That was sure? five years before. Yes, that's when I was just getting started in the Sex Freedom League. Got it. And so then just a Hall of Issues had a, had a thing where you could come and raise any issue. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget, it was a really frightening moment. I had a guy staying with me, 45 years old, from the University of Texas visiting, I'd gone to college with him. He said, you're gonna go up there in that hall? You're gonna stand up and say, you're a homosexual? I, I, I'm gonna have to put, I'm gonna put this in proper English so you don't have to edit it out, but it was a frightening thought. He said, okay, let's do, let's just, just tell you a little trial run here. And he said, he said Mr. Mr. Wicker, you say you're a homosexual. Does that mean you have oral sex with men? Except he used a much more slangy term. And he said, what would you say then? And you don't want to know something? My blood ran cold. I had no idea what I would say. Because, you know, who knew when you thought you're going up there, you're going to get up and talk about homosexuality, I was thinking in terms of the laws in Illinois, the proposal, the model penal code, studies that showed that we weren't all sick. And what if somebody asked me a question like that? But guess what? In all my years of talking to groups, no one ever asked me any question like that. What they did ask me is, do you home at night and put on a dress? No, I don't. Do you want a sex change operation? No, I don't. But uh, Randy, I, I definitely, I understand. <laughs> That's great, but I, I, wanna, I wanna really try to nail down this time period though, because I, I want to, especially while we're here, I want to really sort of focus on what happened in those preceding days right after Stonewall. You said that you went that Saturday night. I um, went I went a couple nights looking for the action. Supposedly they were, they were supposedly, you know, the police were on guard and we heard they were gonna, you know, there was a lot of talk about people saying, oh, it's Stonewall and there's something's gonna happen tonight somewhere. We keep going over looking for it, but in the two or three days that we went over in the evening, we never saw anything. Okay, so then, all right, that's fine. So what, if you can remember now, because I want to I wanna sort of try to understand what was the, what was the climate like after Solo, but before I go there, I want to try to understand, before we move on to there, what did you say you didn't see anything? Because um, there's some accounts where it says that you did, I was just curious if you did or didn't. Whatever it is, is fine. Whatever you can remember is fine. But what can you tell, what can you, if you could sort of picture back that moment, stepping back into, into the, uh, the West Village at the time, what did you physically see? For somebody who wasn't there, wasn't alive at the time, could you tell me what you saw with your eyes? I saw a sign in the window that said, Manichean Society asked its members not to, to, not to cause civil disorder to, to obey the law. That those pictures, you, my, my exact wording may be off, but essentially that's what they said. So were there people milling around the street? Were no, no, it was, it was amazingly, as a matter of fact, I have a feeling that the police presence, that it was almost like a police state, because I think the police really were on guard, did not want to have any disorders, and therefore, I mean, people don't tend to hang around when they see a police officer a half a block away walking their way. So I think it, there was a, certainly, uh, there was actually less, less people on the street than ordinarily you would expect to see there. And so that next day, did you go back the next day, that Sunday? Yes, I went back. I went two or three days running. 
what did you see those things? We never, we never saw anything. Got it. And, and, so, I, go ahead. Go ahead. and I don't remember, I don't remember any follow-up stories. That might be wrong, but I don't remember seeing any follow-up stories outside of the reportage in the Village Voice about my dad or whoever was in the, trapped in the bar about how they were breaking down the door and things were getting violent. So what was life like then for you and for other people like that, um, that following week, you know, or the, those following weeks after that? Was it, had the environment sort of changed for gay people in your opinion, or was it sort of the same? Well, actually, actually there, there was a, a very big difference in, in one way. Uh, in Philadelphia, beginning in 1964, they had had a annual reminder in front of Independence Hall where it may be 15 or 20 people. Women had to wear suits and dresses. Men had to wear suits and ties, even though it was 100 degrees. Het, Dr. Hetrick, Dr. Martin came over wearing Bermuda shorts and alligator shirts, a church with alligators on them. They were kicked off the line by Frank Cannon, who said, no, you have to dress suit and tie or, or dresses. And what happened at 1969, because of the anger that Stonewall had created, what had ordinarily been a very tightly monitored, very heavily controlled group. They had this huge influx from New York City, where you had instead of 30 people, you had 130 people. And for that, gone with the dress codes, you had hippies and beads, and you had people in all kinds of dress and whatever. And on the way back to New York City, Craig Rodwell said, we can't have this annual reminder in Philadelphia with Frank Kameny and all these old people writing these strict rules about how you have to dress, every sign has to be approved. We have to have a march next year in New York City. And this is the basis of Philadelphia, and we'll tell you that they really are the, the founding city of the gay movement because the annual reminder that began there actually was the egg that eventually burst into being the first Gay Pride Day. March in New York City in 1970. And so can you talk to me then about uh, what that, 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 why do you think that the, the, the riots themselves sort of spurred that change on? I think that people only, you can only push people around as long as they have a certain lack of self-respect. And I think what had happened, people never seemed to realize the Mattachine Society and all this stuff that went on, the group had very slowly grown and maybe there were a couple hundred activists all across the country. But we knew we weren't sick. We wanted to be safe in our homes. Essentially, we wanted changes in the law, we're consenting acts were legal. So we had a program of what we wanted. We had spelled out, we'd answered all of the questions. And we had Evan and Hooker study to prove there was not a necessary link between homosexuality and mental illness and whatever. So I think that that and the discussion on radio programs and TV programs had the question no longer was how can they be cured, they're all sick, to the more of a discussion, are, are they sick or aren't they? You know, are they, is this something that's a moral choice, a bad moral choice, or an involuntary way of life? So I think that people just got enough of a sense of self in that first march. I'll never forget it because we set off from the village. I'll never, the, it went up a hill. It went to that Central Park. That was yeah, that was in 1970. Time. And I was with Prescott Townsend, who was from, from uh, Boston. He had been a gay activist there for years. And we looked back, and as far as we could see, half of the avenue, this idea that we had always dreamed of, that the gay movement could be a mass movement, that there were millions of us, you know, that, that we should have huge parades. And yet it never happened. You know, and even, even after it got going, where we had the first annual march, the gay, the gay annual march became one of the big things. But I still remember GAA going around in front of bars saying, join us, join us, out of the bars, into the streets, join us, join us. No one did. Activism is something you just have to come to from a grassroots sort of, of level. Well, because I want to, um, because you, we talk, we, we, because this is fantastic, but we, we, and we talked about it briefly, but you mentioned that like the week right after the riot that you did um, sort of have a, um, a talk denouncing, I guess, the violence. In the yes, world. yes. Um, so did you- It was turned into a brawl because the boys were being beaten up. It turned into a riot, so the meeting was dissolved. Exactly, so, but what, what, and what was your, was your response? Did you change your opinion in that regard later, did, or did you realize that 
Well, when I drove that boy home, I was extremely impressed that you've been beaten up three times, and I had never had violence. And, and I don't know, I guess you just, I, I, I really don't know, well, you know, I've always been lucky, insofar as for some reason, uh, people never thought I was homosexual. For some reason, people always assumed that I was heterosexual. I was not someone who was naturally effeminate. My father told me, you don't hold books like a girl, you hold them like a, a man. And I learned the mannerisms. I learned how to behave uh, socially in a way that made me somewhat undetectable. So I wasn't one of those people which some people are very fey and femme and naturally effeminate, and they become victims of abuse and violence. And I never had that happen to me in my life. Do you think that was a, a privilege, or can you speak to that in some regard, for, especially for those who, who may not be so lucky? It, it, it wasn't so much of a privilege. I didn't have, I didn't feel feminine, so I, I wasn't repressing any feminine activities. I would actually say it was simply uh, learning appropriate behavior. I, I really don't think that there, I, I really don't think that Call it good acting, even, if you will. Because to the extent that, that I would behave effeminently, uh, I would have resisted doing so. But there were interesting things that happened. I want to tell you one, one thing that comes to mind. I was from the South. Uh, when I was in high school, I'd gone to this music concert in Newark. I loved this radio station, I loved the music. I went there and found out that I was in the 2% of the audience that was Caucasian. Never entered my mind that it was a black radio station or black music, it just happened that way. But still, because of the stereotypes, I grew up in Baltimore and then in, in Florida, there was this, and also there was a certain image of black men as being dangerous. And I was just enough of a suburban, I just enough of a hick. I was sitting in the subway one night and I was all by myself and there were six or eight or 10, there were a lot, a lot of those threatening black people. And I said, oh, I wonder, I hope, sure, hope that somebody gets here in a hurry, right? And then I heard something. Oh, Miss Thing, you were too much in the bar tonight. And at that moment I said, my people are just faggots like me. And that was a moment in my life I've always considered to be such a moment of enlightenment because it made me realize that sexual orientation trumped racial identity. And I remember back when I was in Phoenix, Arizona for that nine months, the local bar had two big tables. The Caucasians all sat at one big round table and the Mexicans and Native Americans sat at the other. I much preferred sitting with the Mexicans and Native Americans. They were a lot more fun. <laughs> so um, you, you, <laughs> um, you talked about the, um, the big changes with, the, with Philadelphia being, so why do you think Philadelphia then um, was, you mentioned that, sorry, you did mention that Philadelphia was the impetus potentially right. for being the first right. uh, gay parade in the country. So talk to me about the other big changes that happened that, that year, in that year right after Stonewall, right up, up until that first line. Well, I, I, I think that, well, you had, the, you had GLF. I went to a couple GLF meetings, and it was all this consensus stuff and consciousness racing stuff, and they were arguing about whether they should support the Black Panthers. The women didn't like it because the Black Panthers either wanted women to serve coffee. You know, that was, a, that was an issue there, too. They wanted to take on the whole world. At the time, I actually supported Fidel Castro's uh, Cuban Revolution. One year, I marched fair play for Cuba, and a year later, I was demonstrating against Cuba because they were rounding up homosexuals to put them in re-education camps because homosexuality was a capitalist disease. And uh, well, that was a very enlightening moment in my life, too. I supported Castro because he was supposed to bring democracy to Cuba, you know, and get it off the sugar, have diversified crop, crops and everything. But when I went to fair play for Cuba, it means I think, when are we having these elections? You don't need elections when everybody has a gun. At that point, I said, oh, no, no. So I was never further left than a democratic socialist. And then when he started rounding up homosexuals, all I could think about was Hitler. 
began with the gypsies and his political opponents and then went on to the Jews. I said, my God, this is frightening. I went out night after night leafleting all over the city. And on Easter Sunday, I called the demonstration for Easter Sunday off at of the UN. What year was the, that Easter Sunday? That would have been, it must have been 65. Okay, I, yeah, I want to really try to focus yeah, on right. like that period. And we got 22 so people, we got 22 people. Including Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlowski were two people that showed up and Prescott Townsend came down. That got no attention. But Frank Kameny demonstrated one day before in front of the White House and that made Confidential Magazine, which was a big breakthrough. You know why? They gave the Mattachine mailing address. And all of a sudden we were getting letters from all over the Midwest and everywhere else saying, I've always heard about Mattachine, I never know how to contact you. That was a breakthrough to be exposed in Confidential Magazine so that people would know how to contact you. That's how bad it was back before Stonewall. And so then, using that then, what was that first march like? Tell me that, about that first march in 1970. It was fantastic because it was, it was free and uh, people were marching up the avenue and it was the first time that you, anyone involved, I think oh, virtually anyone involved, you know, it's one thing having a demonstration in front of Independence Hall, July the 4th, hot weather, not that many people reacting to you. There wasn't even a sense of camaraderie because we're all dressed up in suits and dresses and ties, make sure to go to the bathroom, you take someone with you, all that type of stuff. This, the march was 1970. It was everybody, I, especially young people, it was so wonderful for me, for me what was so wonderful about Stonewall and about GLF and GAA particularly, was that suddenly there were all these young, articulate people like Marty Robinson, who were just as so good looking and so well spoken, and I wasn't just me anymore. I was off the hook. I often tell people the story that was on the TV show before Stonewall, and that they had Sandra Moran who'd studied under Young, and then us Crane leaned forward and said, Dr. Moran, you mean they're well-adjusted homosexuals and he has a vena, he had a cigar, he could smoke cigars and set those, but he took the puffs and he said, but of course, but of course. And he pointed at me and said, look there. And I'll never forget it. He pointed at me and I saw the camera. And I saw the red light go on. And sometimes I tell people this story and they don't understand. I'm talking about what's going on in my head. But in my head I was saying, no, not me. That isn't what I just stood there and looked into the camera. But it was terrible to be, sort of feel like you were the person. Because I didn't want to be the, the image of homosexuality because I was running around. I was, I, I was in and out of a lot of beds in those days before I settled down. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you feel comfortable being that? I, I think because, because we felt that, well, I had no problem with it because I was flown in Chicago twice uh, to be on the Cup show because there was no one in Chicago willing to go on TV, is that I felt it was too heavy of a burden. I felt like I couldn't, I could, I couldn't really live the wild and woolly life. You know, like, let's face it, I smoked a little pot. You know, I went to some wild parties. I, I had a, a number of short romantic affairs. I mean, I wasn't, I, my idea of who should be the homosexual should be what we have today. Properly married people living with 2.2 adopted children behind white picket fences out in the suburbs having corporate jobs. That wasn't me. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be a cookie cutter heterosexual. The big thing in the movement was the argument between the radicals and the assimilationists. And boy, did the assimilationists win. Because even from the beginning, when they finally started having gay bars and we were more open as a society, I used to think, oh, well, boys will dress up, they'll be more frilly, more colorful, we'll have freedom of dress. No. They all put on Levi 501 jeans, grew mustaches, wore a t-shirt, and became what's called a clone. They were totally, totally, they wanted to do anything to fit into society. And that's what really has come to be, is that I think that, that gay people really they wanted to belong, and to belong meant to behave and be in a certain way, and we were always saying that homosexuals are just like everybody else, and as I jokingly say to people, unfortunately, we turned out to be right, 
because the reason that gay marriage finally passed is by that point, every Vice President Cheney had a daughter and everybody had a co-worker, somebody in the family, or knew someone who was gay. So all of the myths and all the ridiculous stories about homosexuality, homosexuals didn't carry much weight anymore. And um, so, I mean, that's sort of where I was sort of segueing into. Um, in those couple of years after Stonewall, you had, you yourself confessed that you had left the movement. Somewhere. Well, I came back. I came back as a journalist. Cause Talk to me about that. I had opened my button shop, and Al Goldstein was selling screw, which was selling out like hotcakes. He was doing it off a kitchen table. So when he could bring me 100, 200 copies of screw, I'd just pay him $100 on the spot, which he needed, because the distributors would wait till it's the third issue before they pay you for the first. And he used to, add, he decided with Jack Nichols that he would put out a gay publication. And actually, he challenged me. He said, uh, why don't you write for Screw? Now, I had given up writing because I had written professionally. I, my last assignment was for Employee Relations Bulletin, Personnel Magazine. And it was to go, I, first I had a counterfeit executive story, which was interesting how people pretended to be graduates of MIT and would schedule phone calls to interrupt the interview and would get their ways in these middle level jobs, paying 50 or 100,000, which would be more like a million today. And then the next one was to go down to Chemical Bank and talk to them, the personnel department, about how they communicated to the new employee that the bank was seriously interested in his or her welfare. And they went down, this man turned over these charts and showed me, this is problem, look, our rate of turnover has decreased 22%. And I went back and typed this out, wanted to throw up on the typewriter, and I handed it in to the woman. I said, you know, I said, I didn't become a writer to write this. It really bothered me to write this. She said, let me tell you. I can give you as much work as you want, you know, but we have to write for the market. Now, the market will employ personnel agencies and big corporations. Write for the market, write for the market. And I went home that night and I said, I do not want to write for the market. I'm only going to write what I want to write. And I didn't write anything for five years. 1969, a month before Stonewall, Al Goldstein, I took him up on his, his that he said, I'll publish anything you write. Now he titled it rather crudely, Up the Ass as a Gas. But the opening paragraph set the, set the tone because I said, well, sports fans, if you want to know how to screw, you've got to be screwed first. Used in a little bit more vulgar language of that. And then according to the judges, then what happened? Screw got busted for my article. Why? Because the judge just said that my article gave specific instructions of how to obtain maximum gratification out of sodomy. Sodomy was against the laws in New York State at that time because Rockefeller had done a pocket veto on the repeal of the law that had been passed. So a month before Stonewall, I got screw busted and the, the bus was upheld on appeal because technically it was sort of like I'd give an instruction on how to rob a bank or something, which I thought was a rather amusing corollary. Uh, and four years later, though, it was totally different. He reprinted it on the fourth anniversary of Screw, saying, can you imagine if this article was busted just four years ago? So when I took my pen up in hand until I was voted into the uh, Professional Lesbian and Gay Journalist Hall of Fame, I considered that was the highlight of my entire writing career, that when I took the pen back in hand and wrote what I wanted to write, the judges in their black robes just scurry out to peruse what I had written. Ooh, and that, and that could so anyway, Jack Nichols started a gay newspaper. I closed my button shop. The lease was up, and the button craze died out. And for the next couple of years, I was advocate, correspondent, and reporter for gay. I was able to make maybe $100 a week, which barely paid the rent-controlled apartment rent that I had. But it enabled me to, to struggle on. I also tried putting out a diet magazine. It was a big flop. And these, this is from... In the Ni from 1971 to 72. Gotcha. I did go to England with my little 8 millimeter camera, and GLF had a demo there in the park that I filmed, which is the first existing footage. They went out and played in London Bridges, falling game, kissing games, pulling ropes, and carrying on in the park, which was quite charming. Was that the boys' kit, that, that, was, that was in England. Was that, was that your first time abroad? Yes, yes. First time in, first time in England, yes. What was that like for you? 
Well, that was uh, very charming. And one of the boys there had uh, actually visited me when I was running my button shop, uh, visit me and uh, stayed with me in Brooklyn. And I was, uh, uh, so anyway, I was essentially a, a, a journalist, but I had a book contract, I think with Random House. It was a very big firm, but it had $1,500, which was a lot in 1971. No, I'm sorry, I had a book contract in 1966. Wrong, that's what's called my radio career. And I interviewed this woman. It was what people thought about money. I don't know why they assigned me this book. Somebody, some editor thought I was a great interviewer on BAI and they got me this book contract. I interviewed this black woman. She said that when the check came, she had to decide whether to buy food for the, to eat or warm clothing for her daughter. And I said to myself, I don't give a damn what people think about money. I want to go out and make some money. At that point, I gave up writing. I went and I took, I had a very small inheritance from a, from a great uncle and opened a button shop with $3,500. And one year I netted 200,000. I mean, I grossed $200,000 and netted 40. Even made the business page of the Washington Post bull market in buttons. I essentially was a button king. So anyway, that was from 67 to 71. Then when that played out, that's when I closed my button shop and that's the point where I had gone to England and then I came back, I became a journalist for gay newspaper and for The Advocate. Yeah, I see that. And, and, right. so, and also talk, talk, and so when did you join again the Gay Activist Alliance? I joined them right after they started because I had no yeah. use for GLF. I think it was 70, what's it been? GLF only lasted six months. So it must have been 19, 71 maybe, or 70. I mean, I'm not, I know the GLF, GLF is so overrated because they had a very short lifespan. They were extremely fractious. And what it was that the people that really wanted to do something for the community, we want to focus on gay issues to deal with the things we really had to deal with, being kicked out of apartments, fired from jobs, and all that. So by limiting their focus on that, some of the radicals in GLF, like Bob Kohler was one, who just used to think GA were just a bunch of pigs. I mean, he was a radical to the end, but he and I became friends. That's the interesting thing in life. And Sylvia Rivera was considered a very obnoxious, abrasive person. She'd come in the meetings and make a lot of noise. She was one of the few, few Spanish people, one of the very few drag queens. There was another one who was very conservative, who gave a great speech to city council back in the days who were fighting for the gay rights bill. But anyway, as a journalist, I went out and covered all types of things. And I won't tell this story because it's very central to my life. There was a leaflet saying they would execute a puppy opposite St. Patrick's Cathedral. And the reason for this demonstration was to prove that a puppy's life was more important than a drag queen's life because police or people were beating up drag queens or killing drag queens near Times Square. And as a journalist, I said to myself, I have never heard of a worse idea for a demonstration in my entire life. So I go up to St. Patrick's. Now, the interesting thing about this is, it relates to an article I read a few years ago about how every time we have a memory, we take it out of a box and we put it back, it changes. I remember writing the article and I remember saying, Mr. Sylvia Rivera showed up wearing lipstick and earring, lipstick and earring. And in my memory, I tell people, an article this long, 10 not, wrong, but only Sylvia Rivera, and I remember the venom as I wrote this. I finally, and so Sylvia Rivera hated me, hated, would not be on any panels with me for 20 years. So 1989, she even got up and walked out of a community center 20 years after Stonewall. Marsha chased after and said, you should give Rainey a chance, he's not as bad as you think. But anyway, what it was is when I, two things, it's Marsha's funeral. I said to Sylvia Rivera, we have to bury the hatchet for Marsha. And we commenced talking. And she was living in a homeless encampment down at the pier. It was called Gay Pier, about eight, six or eight all gay houses. The other pier were some trans people there, but they were all into drugs. Gay Pier were all alcoholics. And this was near that garbage. There was something. Was this? this was 1992. But Marsha died in 1992. So Sylvia and I started talking. And I think what's so wonderful about this story is that we were rabid enemies. 
I also learned through having Marsha live with me that I understood what it was that feminine personas exist in male bodies. You know, it's not gendered, gender related necessarily. And she said, well, Mr. Wicker, just give me a chance to work at the store. And I was selling Christmas on them. I had these little dolls, any that strung with gold string. So I put her to work doing that. And amazingly, the minute she got through with that, if I was busy with a customer, she'd see the counter was dirty, the floor was needed. She was a self-starting employee. Make a long story short, she became a very good employee. When they finally closed down Gay Beer, she even moved in with me and slept on my, in my living room for six months. And, I, and through the experience of knowing Sylvia, I was there when she spent the last, I'll go back to the original story. I finally found the original story. Michael Cassino made me look it up. Who did? Michael Cassino, who did Pay It No Mind. It's free on YouTube, Pay It No Mind, Life and Time to Marsha B. Johnson. And when I finally found this story, I only said Mr. Sylvia Vera once. Sylvia Vera was not alone. Marsha P. Johnson was with her. Star was with her. And there were four or five other demonstrators. I was just amazed because you, know, you read these things and you say, well, that's interesting. You know, we change our memories as we unpack and repack stories. And I actually was amazed because the venom that I remember so insidiously, which I, at the founding thing of Cooney, I got up and apologized publicly to Sylvia for having treated her the way I did as a venom dripping journalist. I'd done it so cleverly only someone like, only Sylvia really felt the pen. I, was, I had skillfully thrown the dagger in a way that it really didn't show that much in the article itself. What do you think the reason was for that venom? You know, that now looking back on it, I mean, outside Well, because at the time, I can say, first of all, she was very aggressively obnoxious. She would go, she was drunk, she was a drug user. Then she sobered up, she went up to up Dobbs Ferry, New York, and lived with a guy for 10 years. She got off, or she was not, Mainly, she was just drinking. She wasn't doing that, much, that many drugs anymore. She had calmed down a great deal. She left the city and came back after about 10 or 15 years. And so my image of her was mainly from G, GLF and also at that famous thing that happened on the stage. I'll never forget that. I was sitting right there in the front row when she took over the microphone and gave a great speech about, what are you doing about your brothers and sisters in jail? And this was surreal because I said to myself, I've never known anyone in jail, any brothers and sisters in jail. I don't know anyone in jail. And if you looked at that audience, if you look at it, if they ever show any that audience, at the beginning, there were no minorities at all. The gay movement was composed of middle class, maybe middle class younger males. Very, not that many females either, because a lot of the females were tied up with feminism, daughters of Midas, or were separatist females rather than females that work with the movement, like Barbara Giddings and Gay Tobin, who are two of my biggest allies, by the way, my best friends. But, and I remember saying, you know, I, did, I never knew anyone who was in jail. And when she finally came back to the city and we became friends, and she started working for me, I saw her pull all these disparate groups, like there were only a few in Philadelphia, a few in Boston, a few in Washington, D.C., some more people from Baltimore, Delaware. And she put together, through hours and hours of work, the first march ever that was specifically focused on issues of transgendered people. And I was there, and I had to take a cab to catch up with them because we were halfway down to the courthouse by the time I closed my store. And she was taken to Italy, thank God, turn of the century. They had a big gay march there, and they hailed her as the mother of the transgender movement. And Sylvia also was very nice because she knew how Mattachine had been discarded. And when they made her like Hispanic Activist of the Year in 2000 or 1999 or 2001, she'd go down and say, remember, we have to remember that we are not the only ones, that there were people before us, you know, like Harry Hay and the Mattachine Society, and somebody she had mentioned me as well. And so it was an amazing thing to have somebody go from being one of your arch enemies. When she finally got, they got money, she worked at the kitchen at MCC Church, she quit drinking completely started an affair with Julia Murray, which actually I financed that relationship because Julia was her assistant in the shop. But 
to, to have that wonderful experience. As I remember the last time I saw her, I, I told her, I said, I, I always thought you'd be the one that would be speaking up about me or talking at my memorial service. And she's in my hand and I said, don't worry, I'm in good hands. And, uh, you know, she, on her deathbed, she got Reverend Pat to promise she'd open the Sylvia Rivera house. The EPSA people apparently promised her that they would include trans people in their bill that was pending in Albany, which promised which they did not keep. And uh, so that, that's, uh, that's something, and, and same thing happened with Bob Kohler. Bob Kohler, I used to look at him, I knew that he was very far left, and I just really had contempt for GLF and, and all this consciousness raising and all this stuff. He continues to have contempt. We never got over the GAA versus GLF argument, but as friends, we both own shops, and we both, when you get older, political differences you have as younger people don't really count that much, although we did argue about Barty Frank. I think mean, Barty Frank was an incredibly brilliant, wonderful, wonderful example of the community. He said, Barney Frank's a pig. <laughs> you can't have a bigger difference of opinion than that. But we learned to, to accept each other from where we were coming from. And what about Marsha P. Johnson? Well, Marsha P. Johnson came into my house. I had taken in this boy who was sort of like an adopted son. And uh, he said, uh, he told me when he met me, he was a stripper at the Gaiety Club. He had been the New Year's baby or something. And he said, oh, I hang out in the village. I go out with Marsha P. Johnson. I said, I don't know if that's the kind of person you really want to hang out with, you know? Because I had covered Marsha once for gay newspaper. Some people in GAA had rescued Marsha from Bellevue, Bellevue a medical ward. They had gotten into the mental hospital and managed to smuggle her out in the crowd in the elevator. They freed Marsha. And my impression of Marsha was she was sweet, a little sweet, gentle, a little bit dippy, flaky maybe. But I said to Will, I said, I'm not sure you'd want to have, hang out with someone like Marsha. So it was, he had moved in for about two or three months, and he said, it's 10 degrees outside. He said, could Marsha come here to sleep on the rug? She likes to sleep on the floor. And Willie was, had no education. He was illiterate. He couldn't read or write, but incredibly brilliant, incredibly perspective. One of the things he once told me, which I found out to be true, remember this always, first thing I, then they steal. And I can tell you, every person who's ever stolen from me has lied to me first. Ever since he told me that, I check it out. Every time something like that happened, I'm like, damn it, I knew that person was a liar. I should have known he was a thief too. But anyway, he said, Marsha, come and spend the night on the floor. I said, you sure she won't steal? Oh no, Marsha wouldn't steal. So Marsha B. Johnson came into my house that night and lived with me for the next 12 years. And Marsha P. Johnson was the greatest Greatest thing, the greatest gift. How many people have somebody that is so beautiful and so pure and so real and so generous and so giving? You know, uh, I look back on my life and I, can, I, I tell people, you know, some people accuse me of collecting cripples because I was always taking people in. And I've been ripped off my share of times. I made my share of mistakes. But for all the, all, taken as a broader picture, I think too many of us live in too defensive a world. We're so damn worried about what somebody might take or take. If you don't gamble on other human beings, you end up being lonely, and maybe end up being wealthy and lonely. But who wants to live that life? But taking Marsha B. Johnson in was so wonderful. She would be able to, I remember times I was so depressed sitting there. I remember one time I was depressed because I thought I was being invited to a friend's family's Thanksgiving dinner. And she got up and she could see I was really sitting just in the bottom pit of depression. Thanksgiving, nowhere to go. And she said, Jesus loves me. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. And I just cracked up. I said, what in the world did you <laughs> She said it's Sunday school. And I'll never forget crazy things happened with Marsha. I remember once we were cooking the Thanksgiving dinner. And Willie said, Oh, we don't want to sit here and just have this turkey. Let's take this turkey up to the Gaiety Theater and share it with everybody. This at the theater. It's a strip theater. You know, the boys dancing are mainly prostitutes. So we packed up, we put it all in my truck, we ran up to the Gaiety Theater. 
we took it in. We, of course, we made sure we were first in line, but we shared our Thanksgiving dinner with every. But all these poor lost souls who had nowhere else to go on Thanksgiving but sitting in a strip house. And, and things like that were so magical in the way I gave her once a big brooch. Oh, it was missing two stones. It would have been a $50 brooch. It was a deco, beautiful brooch. She went down to Christopher Street, walked a block, and some little queen said, Oh, Marsha, that brooch is so beautiful. And Marsha said, Oh, you think you like it? She would give it away. Once I bought her a rabbit coat, beautiful rabbit coat for $20. I mean, it was really fine. And, and she walked down Christopher Street, some queen liked it, and she gave it away. And what everybody said about Marsha, it was a common observation about people that knew her. They said, you know, I don't know anybody in the world who has less than Marsha P. Johnson, and yet I don't know anybody in the world who's as happy as Marsha P. Johnson. And that's why there's a poem by Bobby Miller about how she would panhandle for change on, on Christopher, especially up around Stonewall National Park in Sheridan Square. And she'd get enough money, a dollar fifty or something, but it'd be enough for a dinner in those days. She'd start walking down the block. She'd see some queen that was hungrier than her. She'd give it to them and she'd go back and panhandle some more. I remember once Willie complaining to me that he had walked down to the river and he had two dollars for a box of chocolate chip cookies. He said, you know, by the time we got to the river, Marsha had given away all, there wasn't one chocolate chip cookie left, and I know why that was. Because Marsha knew what it was to be hungry and to live on the streets hungry, and she knew that for a hungry person, a chocolate chip cookie was a wonderful delight. Because Willie once said to Marsha, the only time I ever saw him make Marsha a little bit, a little bit edgy, he said, I hear people saw you eating out of the garbage. I saw people here seeing you eating out of the garbage. He really, oh, he gave this Marsha such a hard time. He was like a little monster. But he loved her. He'd call me, bring me up and change your clothes at the gate. She'd ram up there and he'd give her $80. But anyway, so she, he said, what was it like eating out of the garbage? And Marsha, in an amazing moment of rather seriousness, said, well, Willie, it really wasn't much fun. Because lots of times when you eat out of the garbage, the food isn't very good and you get sick. I think it was one of the few times I, I saw Marsha really kind of like, like throw something back at Willie in that way. And I, 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 it's funny because I always think of that and I always think of that story about the chocolate chip cookies and they go together so beautifully in my mind. And you can imagine what it was like for 12 years to know I'm not the most entertaining person in the world. I'm a businessman, you know, I'm in my 40s or 50s, whatever I was. And to know that whoever you met, if you were taking them home, to hope, taking them over to Hoboken, you know, to, they would meet Willie and they'd meet Marsha P. Johnson. I knew that anyone I met, I had no worries in the world that no matter who I took home, they would love Marsha P. Johnson. This may seem like a, a tough question, um, but I, especially in this day and age, you know, it, I, I think it's somewhat important to raise the awareness of the issue about it. Why do you think the trajectory of a lot of the minorities or trans individuals from Stonewall sort of seemed like they took a different direction than some of the sort of more affluent sort of white men, cisgender men sort of during that period of time? Well, first, there was no acceptance because they didn't even want drag queens to march in the parade. So Sylvia and Marsha decided they would just go up and get ahead of the parade. So it was like the drag queens were leading the parade. So then they decided they had to have Marsha in. I remember people from Heritage of Pride saying that the day that Marsha B. Johnson volunteered to sell, like they sold dance tickets and things at their tables in the village, they felt like they had finally, re had finally reached the point that they really represented everyone because Marsha was universally beloved in a way that I don't think anyone I've ever known has been. And so what do you think then the larger impact of you, Sylvia, Marsha, Bob, so many countless other people, what do you think now today looking back that larger impact has been on the world, on not just the gay community but the world in general? Well, 
I myself have been somewhat of an outsider because back in the day, I, like I said, I left the gay movement, got involved with the Sex Freedom League, was editor of the marijuana newsletter, marched in the anti-Vietnam marches, ran a psychedelic button poster protest shop in the East Village, then I became a journalist. And I always liked the idea of gadfly. Gadfly was a girl who ran for the editor Daily Text and said she wanted to be a gadfly. I like being a gadfly. I like to provoke and I like to investigate things. That to me is always of interest. But what the real, the real thing that's happened is that we really, you know, I often wear a hat, an American flag glitter hat. I have one in my bag because anytime I put it on, people always like it. Of course, now Donald Trump might make that almost not the case anymore. But my patriotism, my love for this country, Patriotism in this country has won for me. Because you don't understand, when I started out, we were criminals in every state but Illinois. We were universally considered sick. We were considered child molesters, morally corrupt, worthless people. I mean, we were deranged. And to see in our society that you could go out in the public square, and I was very fortunate to be one of the first, but there were others before me, one magazine, use the mails, and they tried to keep them from using the mail. They won a Supreme Court judgment saying that homosexuals had a right to opinion, a right to mail their opinions in the mail. That was something one did before I even joined the movement, or about the time I joined, 1958. By the way, they were conservative Goldwater Republicans, believe it or not. Unbelievable. There are some very interesting conservative people in our background. Uh, I think that the real thing is also that What we have really done is, first, we have proven that America, for all its flaws and all its shortcomings, and all for all the facts that there are three steps forward and then two steps back. Three steps forward. But slowly, the arc of history, as Robert Kennedy said, does bend in the right direction, in the, in the way of justice. And I think, especially here, uh, we have achieved something that gay marriage, the fact that gay, I used to think gay marriage, I was a, I, I wrote an article in 97 saying gay marriage is a heterosexual trap. Because if I had been legally married to my second lover of 18 years, David Combs, I would have been responsible for all his medical bills. The government would have owned my shop, my antique shop at Christopher and Hudson Street instead of me. And also things that people never realize, if you marry somebody, and that somebody goes off and runs up a gambling debt in Las Vegas of $50,000, you're liable. It isn't all just all about the 1,150 rights that we have in marriage. There's also another whole side of that, and that's responsibility, responsibility to pay their medical bills, to, to if they do damage, wreck your car or something, you know, you're, you're on the hook too. It's like really a, a real union. It isn't all just a one-way street. But I, of course, realize that for those that want that, you know, knowing what they're getting into, I think a lot of people, I used to think if they had gay marriage that every queen in town would be running off on a weekend getting married in Las Vegas or something. But I think if people have come to realize that getting married is much more serious than that. And that a lot of the people that have gotten married are actually those people who have been together long enough that they know that they're gonna to be together forever. I had one eight-year marriage, and it almost destroyed me when it ended. I got intestinal problems and everything. And then I started my second relationship with David Combs, who was somewhat, you know, he was 21, and I was, I guess, 70, 72, so I was uh, 34. And he got me into the antique business. And we had a stormy relationship. It was a very brief period when he sort of, he used to have hair, he used to look very much like, I, I have a very strange position in life, and that is that I find androgyny very attractive. I find feminine males, small features like Asians, uh, to be much more attractive than the average Arnold Schwarzenegger type people. So I have a type of taste that's not very common among gay males. It's one thing I used to lie about. People used to ask me, well, what do you find attractive? I mean, probably the only lie I ever told was a gay spokesperson. I said, I find other masculine, very masculine men attractive like anyone else would because I knew that 99.9% .9 of gay males did not share my taste in that regard. 
But anyway, so since we've achieved it here, what I think is so important today, two things. Number one is, since 2012, I've been marching with the Russian-speaking gay people. I was gonna march with a trans group, but Sylvia Vera Project wasn't marching. So I had put up a video about gay Russians march proudly in New York City. It had gotten so much hate. Like, all these people are disgraced, all Slavs, they should all be killed. I never heard of Slav pride, and I knew there were Slavic people, but to me, Slav almost sounds like Slav, you know I mean? I, I'm not putting down Slavic people, but, but I showed up and they were amazed when I decided to dress up like Uncle Sam and I marched with them. And since that time, Masa Gessen was there a couple years ago and they, they're mainly, mainly Jewish. They have their meetings at the gay synagogue and yet they have an underground railroad where they have people in places like Latvia where maybe there's only one or two ministers that are sympathetic but they have connections in Chechnya and the Soviet Union, these people that are literally in danger of their lives, and they are, have, we have an underground rainbow railroad operating today. They'll, they'll take these people and they'll put them up at home, take them to different parts of the country. One boy I met there had been one of the few Russians to stand up and criticize the Solskjaer Olympics. He claimed he was the only one, but John O'Brien, a friend of mine, who's the story that there were 18, but one by one, his friends started getting arrested and disappeared. He finally got a visa to come here. And now he's apparently engaged. He's going to school in Iowa or something. So these are, this is what we're not doing. All we're worried about, we're focused on wedding cakes instead of the lives of our LGBT brothers and sisters all over the world. Uganda, if you stand up and say I'm gay, they had a gay wedding there. As a matter of fact, years ago, of course, they raided it. But in that place, they put your name in the paper and your neighbors will kill you. You don't have to worry about the law. The preachers were trying to make it a death penalty. And I think there's a danger, danger in the myth of Stonewall because it's sort of the American ethos. Stand up, demand your rights. We're here, we're proud, you know, we want our rights. That sounds nice, it might play nice in the movies, but the reality is that you can't do that in the Middle East. You can't stand up in the Middle East, you'll end up getting killed by your family or by other people in the neighborhood. And we don't care. I, I just made a video with people from Brazil that, that they are very upset because this guy that's coming into Brazil says he wishes his son, if his son was gay, he'd rather him be dead in an auto accident. You know, and, and they're in, in Brazil, parts of Brazil, trans people are stoned to death while they stand around and applaud, which is exactly what happened to Amanda Milan, I believe, in the Port Authority doorway when this cab driver stabbed her to death. All the other cab drivers were standing there applauding. I mean, it was one of the seminal moments in the trans movement. It's the first time the New York Times went from saying a man in a dress was stabbed in the Port Authority dressway to actually start looking into the issues of transgender people. So I think that's the first thing is we are doing nothing to help people. Our brothers and sisters overseas were so concerned with miniature things at home. The second thing is that we don't realize that slavery, slavery is all over the world today. Women are slaves, women are chattels all over the Middle East in every poor country of the world. They don't have any right, they don't have right to vote or they are set to arrange marriages or they're bought and sold like chattel. And until women have equality and have a chance to develop their own skills and intelligence, the world is never gonna get over its overpopulation project. That's the most important thing in my opinion. And in fact, I tell people, it's funny, I've not yet found one person yet, male or female, that disagrees with me. I say, you know what? I just like to t not let men vote for the next 10 years and let the women, they would solve the problems of the world. It's amazing. I find almost every male and every female, I say that to, as some people here are nodding and smiling. Because it's true. What have we gotten with this toxic masculinity, with this stupid machismo that we see? It, it's, it, destroys, it destroys the men themselves. And I speak as a, someone who was a, a male chauvinist pig most of my life. I mean, I was a, I mean, I was a very selfish role player sexually and everything else. I tell people you're consumed by it. The more you abuse them, the more you just use them, you know, they make you more a man. If you do something for them, you're less of a man in their eyes, especially when it comes to like role players that are very common among Latino countries. Who neither of my lovers were Latino, but what I'm saying, and, and that's where we're, law, we're, we're not doing anything, no one cares. No one cares about what's happening to people 
outside of the United States of America, and that they don't care about, they care a little bit about women, at least uh, there are national campaigns, because it's not, it's not the men of America that care, it's the women of America that are caring. The women of America, whether you know it or not, are taking over. Just, I'll be dead and gone when you finally realize this is true. 60% of the people in college are female. We are going from a muscle society. We no longer need steel workers and people that, that work with their muscles. We need people that work with their minds. And women are taking over the, the educational environment in our schools. And I think it, the ascendancy of women cannot come fast enough in this society. Because I really do believe that women are peacemakers and men are war makers. And I really, I feel like a turncoat for saying that, having been one myself. But it's the truth, and you get to see that as you get older. And you see the crazy competition that goes on, and the crazy values that men put on things, everything from breast size to penis size, the whole world revolves, they, their brains are between their legs, not between their ears. And women are more like with their hearts. So what do you think, you touched on it briefly, but what do you think is the uh, sort of, what are your thoughts about the current generation of trans activists? Like trans that? activists have a very unique role, and there's a reason. I think that a lot of people are probably, they, I haven't heard people ask this question aloud, but I answer it aloud. Why is there this current obsession with trans people? The reason is that trans people are the real missing link between male and between homosexuals and heterosexuals through males and females. Because if we start discussing what it is that makes a man without including the genitalia or what it is that makes a woman without defining that as genitalia, we, get, we bring the discussion down to a much, much different level. And I think that's very important because they, and also the fact the New York Times, I've never found out why, maybe you can find out why, they said 19.2%, I think it was 19.2 or 19% of transsexuals are heterosexuals. Now I know a lot of heterosexuals, they're men, they're married, they have, they have children, and suddenly they transition in their 50s and end up in a, they still are attracted to women, but they go from being straight men to being lesbians. But the cross-dressers who have a very, very bad uh, reputation in society, especially if they're not accepted among trans people either, because I've heard, I've heard transsexuals call them fetishists. And yet I've interviewed some at the Gay Expo, and she says, by day I'm a man, at night I go home and put on a dress and become a lesbian. Well, you know, there's a wonderful movie I saw at the gay festival called Tuft. It's about someone who works as a drag queen who's actually a straight man. Everyone assumes he's a faggot because he makes the jokes and he, 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 he performs in drag. But people don't realize that just because you're a guy who identifies as a woman, that doesn't mean, that doesn't really tell us, does not really define your sexuality. You're not necessarily gay. You're very likely to have a married man who always was attracted to women, but then had gender identity issues. And so you went from being a straight man to becoming a lesbian. Or if you're a very masculine lesbian who always hated having breasts and everything, you become a, with hormones, you become a, a heterosexual man and whenever I tell this to people, that you know, a heterosexual man can become a lesbian or a lesbian can become a heterosexual man, they all, they all say, wait, wait, run that by me again. And why do they say that? Because it just takes those categories of sexual orientation, gender identity, man, male, female, heterosexual, homosexual. It just beats them up like a big mix of eggs. You can't see the yolks from the whites anymore. And that's good. Because that's really what we need to do in society. It's a real, I, I take, I'm of the position, every human being begins as a female embryo. Some of us get that Y chromosome kicking in after two or three weeks. But the reality is we all start as female. So there's no such thing as really total female or total male. We're all a mixture of both. And I think, I think it's an arbitrary, very bad pressure that we put on people, especially males. It, to be a real man, you know, you got to be tougher. You got to be able to punch harder. You got to be able to fight harder. You got to be able to kill more. You got to be on top. You got to be able to beat them down, take control. And where is that rooted? It's rooted back in the day of the hunter and the gatherer, all where brute strength. That's how men dominate women, because they're physically stronger than women. 
but we're, that day of is passing because now we're in the day of data, date of internet, date of mind, and women hopefully will come and get hold of enough power that there'll be some equilibrium in the world and we'll keep ourselves from going to the macho oblivion. And, um, in our last few minutes, um, this is great by the way, um, what, do you, um, what do you think is missing from the, um, the, the histories of Stonewall or maybe some of the people, any interesting thoughts that you think haven't been yeah, yes. ever discussed? Or? Magnus Hirschfeld was the doctor in Germany who started the gay movement, I think, in 19... 1897, did very well, had, had proposals, was making headway with intellectuals in society until 1932. That is 35 years. And then what happened? The Nazis came in and everything was totally wiped out. The gay, the gay center was destroyed. All the gay libraries were burned. We had hit or put homosexuals to death in, in camps. So I think there's a real lesson there that we should always be aware of, and that is that there's always a danger, as long as, this is one reason why I so much want to be involved worldwide, because as long as there's rabid homophobia anywhere, it's a threat to us everywhere. Because, you know, that, that is, it's just like the Ebola, it's just like the Ebola virus. You never know when it'll get loose or when it'll be manipulated by somebody who's good at manipulating the public mind. And uh, what are your thoughts about the future? Um, I mean, do you have any sort of hopes for the future, thoughts about the future, sort of where we are now? Actually, if you could speak to where we are now and then talk about sort of... Well, I think, I think the future is, is obviously the planet's overheating. I'm 80 years old, so I'm not going to be here to, to see. I think that only two or three things can happen in the future. It's going to be a horrible plague. It's going to decimate the population. You know, if we don't... If we don't get population under control, and as long as women are chattel or made to be nothing but homemakers and child bearers, that's not going to stop. And then so either plague or there's going to be some terrible war. Something's going to do to, to, to drastically reduce the population. Unless we do it through liberation of women, we know that in places all over Europe, all over Italy, where women get the ability to earn and support themselves, they don't all choose to be mothers and homemakers. So therefore, the populations in the world that are really industrialized, that are really developed, are not even replacing themselves. But I'm, I'm talking about also the gay movement in particular. What are your sort of hopes about the future of that movement? I, Actually, where, if you could speak to quickly where we are now, and then what do you think the future, the hopes the future of that is? But where we are now, I think in the United States, we have more or less achieved most of our goals. And I would hope that, that in the future, that the American symbol, the American story, will be told and will inspire others. Because to some degree, the, you can't move quicker than the culture. You can't enforce like the sensibilities that we have. We can't enforce those values on others. People have to come to those values through education and through learning and through cultural awareness. This happened in, there was a situation in Latvia they wanted to have, the gay community was divided. Some wanted to have a gay demonstration a few years ago, and some said, no, it's not ready for it. What happened is they wanted it. They were denied a permit. The European Union got involved and came in and told Latvia, you have to allow gays to have their gay pride demonstration. Ultimately, they had it. They had a park surrounded by 200 cops. There were only 80 or 90 people came to, demonst to demonstrate, and most of those were foreigners. We're filming. And what it was, even the people that were for the gay march in the beginning said it was a mistake because it had made homosexuality an issue, not of Latvia coming to embrace their own gay people, but making it an issue that the European Union was enforcing their values upon us. I think you have echoes of that in rural communities in America where they feel that just because we say gay marriage, that now we're forcing homosexuality down their throat. But I, I really find that most people are good I've gone out to a lot of flea markets. I know a lot of people sit and listen to Christian radio on a one-to-one. -one. They're not bad people. They have bad leaders. But I think that given, given the opportunity, most human beings make the right moral choices, and most human beings will open their hearts when they really realize what the realities are and they really know. I think when really knowing gay people is the real thing that changes it. 
And uh, just the last question is, um, what are you fighting for now? What are you currently sort of proposing or, or fighting for now? Well, I'm, as I said, I march with the Russian-speaking people, and I'm very interested in trying to push things overseas to save people that are in danger. But they have Stonewall National Park, and it's nothing but four white statues standing out there. Where are the people of color? Where are the people of trans, trans recognition? I would have three things in Stonewall National Park. I'd have a picture of Sylvia Rivera with her fist up somewhere at Stonewall. I'd have Marsha P. Johnson panhandling some change with a poem called by Bobby Miller about her panhandling for change in bronze. And also, I would like to see a big statue of Bayard Rustin replacing Sheridan and having Sheridan Square renamed Equality Square. Because I think that we, that all of, all of us in New York and all of us in the United States have come to real. Sorry, could you repeat that? Well, okay. Please. Could you repeat that sentence again? I said I want to have a big statue of Bayard Rustin replace Sheridan in Sheridan Square and have the square renamed Equality Square because Bayard Rustin was one of the great architects of the Civil Rights Movement. He's an unsung hero. And what I like about Bayard Rustin and Sylvia Vera Marsh is that it includes the trans people, it includes the, because the struggle, the gay struggle, is a civil rights struggle. And Bayard Rustin was the architect of the great civil rights struggle of this country, which did something to eliminate the, the scourge of slavery and the awful racism that this country was born in. Well, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure um, to talk to you today. Any, any last quick thoughts? No, just, just keep informed, just read up. Right. Keep informed and keep, 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 keep covering the news, doing what you're doing, recording history, but also don't look just always in the past, look to the future. Well, thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure. My pleasure.